I, every once in a while I'll tell you the title of the sermon doesn't matter that much, but if you're watching online, the title's there, or if you're going to look it up later, uh, but it's making sense of a crazy world. Uh, that's kind of the, the, uh, the title of this morning's uh, message, and we hope to help make sense of the things that are a little bit crazy, but we're going to pray and briefly talk about some craziness, but not too much, because it's pretty evident. And, and there's a lot of uh, room for dialogue, just not on Sunday morning. So you're going to have to dialogue in your brain with me, and I'm happy to talk to you afterwards uh, over our lunchtime. But uh, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for, for calling us to yourself when we were so undeserving to hear your call. But somehow, Lord, in the wonder of your grace, you have called us to yourself. And again, by the faith you've given us, the gift of faith you've given us, we, we've come to know you and we're learning to trust you. So Lord, uh, I pray you would guide us this morning in your word as we consider the lives that we live and our want to be faithful to you, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Uh, there's a, a number of things happening that raise up our sense of, uh-oh, <laughs> something's up. Yes, the return of Jesus is near, but it has been for 2,000 years. So if I can say that, the return of the Lord is near. It has been. And we're near to the end. I'm not too sure that the things happening now are saying he's coming next week. He may. But it just reminds us of the closeness of the return of Christ. But there are three things that really lift up our sense of, uh-oh, something's wrong. There's always been in this world what we call moral failure. Always. There's been much more terrible moral failures in this world than the time we live in now, for sure. There have been terrible times where you're glad you did not live in them for various reasons, just regarding the morality, the rights and wrongs of humanity, civilizations, and cultures, especially for women. Women had it terribly, terribly hard for all of history until Jesus came. And set you free and said to the Lord, there's neither male nor female nor Jew nor Greek, but we're all one. Nor slave nor free, but we're all one in Christ. Christianity has changed the world for good. But when I say that we go, uh-oh, something's wrong, is because there's now what we call moral decline. Because Christianity has changed the world for good, has brought morality and in a larger scope to the world. There was an article, I didn't read it. But would you, would you rather be raised by the Aztecs or Christianity? And again, if you know anything about the Aztecs, you're going to go, no thank you. The point is, Christianity has changed the world with the goodness and love of God. Oh yeah, there are exceptions. And there has been brutality, there has been error, and there has been right out sin within the church. But as a whole... By far, Christianity has changed the world for good. And America in particular was started by those who had faith in God. Flawed men, flawed women, but faith in God who had a moral compass. But since that time, morality has declined. Not even, I mean, even more so now. As we look at it, we go, uh-oh, because it was here, and now it's here. There was decline in Europe of churches, I said, I, last week or the week before. Thank you, by the way, Jason, for teaching last week. But there is a big decline of churches in Europe, and there are currently something like six, 600 mosques that are being built in, in Europe right now. Uh, we do not see 
uh, in general, again, the Muslim religion as being a religion of peace. And there's a, there's a lot of history that goes with that. I'm not here to talk about that. But the reality is, is that as Christianity declines, so does morality. Uh, we might not realize it, but, you know, we have uh, an admiral who is now uh, the assistant um, uh, health uh, state uh, department health advisor. Uh, his name was Richard. Now it's Rachel. Now, now we go at this, oh, that's okay. We've declined so much that these things are okay to us. But these are mental illnesses that we are saying it's okay. It's just a mental illness. And, and he's not worse than you or worse than me. But we live in a culture that is saying, oh no, that's normal, that's okay. Men can give birth. Is that okay? We have gone off the charts in regards to our sense of right and wrong and our sense of morality. And you want to be in real trouble? Send your kids to college. I know some of us, I've been to college, you've been to college. Some of you are still right in the college mix and I'm not here to offend you. But college is a disaster in my opinion. And it's starting differently. It's not even starting in college. It's starting in our homes, in our families. There's a moral decline where kids don't know the difference anymore of a man or a woman and they can choose whatever they want. We have right now the Attorney General of, of California is suing local school districts who say, we're going to inform your, you, a parent, if your child is choosing a different gender. And be, because the state is saying, no, you have no right to do that as a parent. We have a right to know, but not you as a parent. They're suing local districts. This is not hearsay. This is not conspiracy. This is real governmental stuff. We are in moral decline. We're inviting others from Arizona, for instance, to come here to California to abort your babies. They had, they've had various tests where people go out and go, you know, the eagle has, has little eggs and little babies, and is it okay if we kill it? No, no, don't you dare kill that baby. Well, what do you think about abortion? That's okay. I mean, we just live in a backward world. The NCAA has allowed transgender athletes to compete in women's sports, thereby violating Title IX in its original intent to protect and promote opportunities for women. New Title IX rules just signed by the current administration, which might be the worst in our history, in my opinion, redefine sex to include gender identity. This means transgender athletes will continue to deprive young women of scholarships championships and even personal safety all in this in the name of creating a safe and inclusive space for transgender women more and more men who are claiming to be women are beating women in their sports hundreds of them there's a lot of information on this by the way but it's not it's not about this i'm just saying that we're in moral decline i don't have to do too much or say too much for you to, if you really pay attention and not to be swept away with the tide to go, something is wrong here. I was watching a little bluey thing on cartoons with my grandkids and I had to turn it off as they start going into the whole like crooked agenda about men and, and women and, and their genders. I'm thinking, now I've got to protect my grandkids from moral depravity. Another thing that makes us go, ooh, uh-oh, is the size of government. The larger government gets, the less free you are. Let me say that again to you. The bigger the government, the less free you are. But some of us, we like that. You know why? Because safety trumps everything else. We'd rather be safe than free. 
And as long as they keep us safe, we'll give them money because they're going to take care of us. Hogwash. Freedom means responsibility. Freedom means hard work. Freedom means, means being flawed and, 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 and doing things that we don't like and other people doing things we don't like. But freedom is the answer, not bondage to government. And as government gets bigger, you get less free. And that's going on in huge rates. There's so many new laws, so many new departments that we have to hire more and more people from the public sector. The government is growing bigger and bigger and your freedoms get lesser and lesser. Another thing that makes us go, uh-oh, is that it's not just that they don't want to be moral in regards to Christian morality. They're anti-Christian and anti-Jew. That sentiment is growing in leaps and bounds. We can see it on campuses now. It's not just anti-Semitism. It's anti-Christianity as well. So all the stuff you see on campuses now, on college campuses, that is blocking and stopping everything is part of the moral decline but is the specific anti-Jewish, anti-Christian, Judeo-Christian moral value. And all these things, we go, uh-oh. Some say there's no turning back as, a, as a, an American culture. I don't know if I'm ready to say that. I think I want to say, no, there is, but a part of me says, no, there isn't. But again, I'm just a man. Now, let me move a little bit to this thing. In Israel, there is what's called the Dome of the Rock. It stands boldly and defiantly on the Temple Mount where the Holy Temple once stood in Jerusalem. The second temple was destroyed by the Romans in A.D. 70 after the Jewish people fought to keep the temple pure from Roman idolatry. As the last remnant of the temple, the western wailing wall below the temple mount is the traditional place where Jews gather to pray and they believe it's the only thing that remains from the second temple. Luke and I were in Jerusalem. We were there. In fact, I remember various prayers, but I remember putting a prayer for Tommy on a piece of paper in that wall in the crevice. That wall is the wailing wall, and it's open on this other end, and you can walk over. You can't go to the mosque. It's blocked off, but it is frequented by Muslims. So in the metal of Judaism is this Muslim mosque. That's where they say the temple is supposed to go. Now, part of the problem that's happening now is that Hamas... And other Palestinians are saying, we don't want Israel to get, to get over themselves. We want them to get over themselves because their desire is to build another third temple where that mosque is, and they're going to tear down that temple. We're not going to let them tear down that temple. So in advance, they're attacking Israel. That's part of the underlying message that you can hear from various people within Palestine and Hamas, that part of the reason that they hate the Jews and believe that they don't have a right to exist, by the way, they openly say, it's in their constitution, that, that the Jews have no right to exist as a state. So there's no negotiation with that. But part of the brokenness currently is that they want to that they believe that that the jews want to tear down eventually that dome of the mosque that temple and re, i'm sorry that mosque and replace it with what's called the third temple stay with me throughout almost 1900 years of exile the Jewish people longed to return to Israel and build a third temple in Jerusalem and restore the temple service, including temple sacrifices. Not all of them, but some of them. God is absolutely pure and holy. And second, our sins are offensive to Him and make us unrighteous in His sight. And so, for all these centuries, the sacrifice in particular the Passover, was built in Judaism in order to help 
accentuate or tell the story of God and man. Our great sin, the horror of it, the destruction of it, and the atonement of God that can only come from God. In other words, the buying back of our souls from the evil one by God doing it through eventually his own son, the blood that will be shed by him. So animals were shedding their blood as a picture of the fact that the Messiah was going to come and shed his blood once and for all. But until then, year after year, sacrifices were given in order to tell the story of God and man and man to God. His holiness, our depravity, and our need to be reconciled by blood. And so that is part of the story of the Old and New Testament. When Jesus died on the cross, all our sins were transferred to him and he died in our place. No further sacrifice is needed. But again, most Jews are not Christians. Because Christ gave his life for us, we don't have to sacrifice anymore. When we put our faith and trust in him, the Bible says, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. It says it in Hebrews 10.10. 10. I have read this. It's hard to verify. I've read it various places. But the observant Jews pray, may the holy temple be re- rebuilt speedily and in our day. That current Jews, Orthodox Jews, are praying that the temple re- be rebuilt and re- be rebuilt in our day. Jewish people have always lived in Israel, in the Israeli region. After the World War II Holocaust, the Jews began returning to Israel in great number. In 1948, the Jewish nation was prophetically reborn. Isaiah 66, 7 and 8 states this about Israel. Who has heard or seen anything as strange as this? For in one day, suddenly, a nation, Israel, shall be born, even before the birth pains come. In a moment, just as Israel's anguish starts, the baby is born and the nation begins. Isaiah 66 prophesied to the rebirth of Israel. And ever since, Jews have been returning to the land from all the nations of the earth. Since 1967, there has been a movement in Israel to rebuild the Holy Temple, the Third Temple. However, the main obstacle is that the Temple Mount is currently occupied by the Dome of the Rock. And today, many of the preparations for the Third Temple have already been completed, I read, from Jewish articles. I can't verify them. I have not seen them but I read about it. Including the sacred worship vessels and priestly garments to be worn by the Levites in temple services. As well, over 500 young Jewish men descended from the tribe of Levi have been trained as temple priests to fulfill their duties of worship and sacrifice in the temple. Now, why is this important? We'll get to that in a little bit. But I don't want you to get lost. I'm not just trying to tell you about these things because you, you want to know. It's because it has importance to end time events and why we have current wars happening now there. So I don't want you to be ignorant and just hear things and go and pretend like we know but not really know. That behind the scenes is all of this working out of territory and land, but in particular, the spiritual forces regarding sacrifice and the return of Jesus. The Bible prophesies about wars and rumors of wars in Matthew 24, 6. Here's what it says. When you hear of wars beginning, this does not signal my return these must come but the end is not yet presumably focused on the land of Israel and it prophesies a final assault of the nations against Jerusalem that last line is my line 
So when we hear rumors of wars and wars, it's speaking specifically about Jerusalem. It doesn't mean that the end is here. It just means that these are signs that have to happen. So we want to be careful not to go, oh my gosh, let's make the end come. Let's get the red heifers. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. I think we're ahead of ourselves and we get a little bit conspiracy hit in the face. I don't read the Bible that way, but we'll continue to talk about this. In Ezekiel 39, there's a whole portion there, and 38 we could read. I'm not going to do that. But verse 2, verse 4, and verse 17. It's just, here's some things I just give you a sense of. I will turn you and drive you toward the mountains of Israel, bringing you from the distant north. And I will destroy 85% of your army in the mountains. And you and all your vast armies will die upon the mountains. I will give you to the vultures and wild animals to devour you. And now, son of dust, call all the birds and animals and say to them, gather together for a mighty sacrificial feast. Come from far and near to the mountains of Israel. Come eat the flesh and drink the blood. You hear that? It's a little ominous, isn't it? Let me read you out of Joel, then I'll help you make a little sense of it. Collect the nations, bring them to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to pronounce judgment on them all. Now let the sickle do its work. What's a sickle? Yeah, it's a big pole with a big curved blade on it, and you do this, and you cut all the wheat down. And it's a term used to destroy When the sickle comes in war terms, it's there to mow you down. By the way, earlier, thank you, Jason, for the reading that we had, but there was a word in there, and I read it, I go, how many people know what a fetter is? What's a fetter? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, if you're involved with livestock, and I was involved with horses my whole life, when you put them out to pasture in the designated area, you put hobbles on them. Hobbles are are two leather straps with a little chain between them, and it doesn't let the horse extend its legs. It can do little steps to to eat, but it doesn't let it run off. That's the same as a fetter. When the Bible or hymns talk about the fetter, it means being restrained, connected, so that you can't run off. Okay, sorry. Now let the sickle do its work. The harvest is ripe and waiting. Tread the winepress, for it is full to overflowing with the wickedness of these men. Multitudes, multitudes waiting in the valley of the verdict of their doom. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of judgment. The sun and moon will be darkened and the stars withdraw their light. The Lord shouts from his temple in Jerusalem and the earth and sky begin to shake. But to his people Israel, the Lord will be very gentle. He is their refuge and he is their strength. Do not fight against Israel. We'll talk about that some more. Why I think it's important for Christians to be alongside Israel. Not because they're perfect, not because they're not flawed, not because that they're not sinful people in there, just like they're sinful people sitting here. But because they're, they're God's special remnant. And he blesses those who blesses them and curses those who curse them. Then you shall know at last that I am the Lord your God in Zion, my holy mountain. Zion is another word for Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be mine forever. The time will come when no foreign armies will pass through her anymore. Well, We are not the center of the universe, America. We are not even the center of this world, America. We have a center place currently. I think that we, for a long time, rightly so, have been the sheriffs of the world, on the seas and on land. I think that because of our Judeo-Christian heritage, we've suppressed evil in the world. Doesn't mean that we haven't done evil. Doesn't mean that we're perfect. We've had our share. But as a whole, our moral compass has been to suppress evil. And when the 
when the United States is taken out of that role, we'll see a rampant rise of evil. As soon as, we, as, soon as this administration took us out of Afghanistan as, the, as he did, many of our allies who were there were killed and tortured. And now, within days, it was overrun by, um, by uh, a terrorist who now rule all that land. As soon as the United States moves out of a territory where they're in some ability to sheriff that place, it'll be the vacuum when we leave is filled with terrorists. That's the nature of things. Historically, I'm not just saying that we can... I read government documents telling me this, what's ha- what happened when, when we left and, and who's taken over now. It's like, and it, it only took days. And they took all of our millions and millions of dollars of equipment is now theirs. But when we leave and, and there's, there's a void, it be, it's taken over by those who don't have a, mor- a Christian moral compass. The United States is not the center of the earth or the world in in that regard. One day the center will be that it is in Israel. The last and final war is in Israel. Jesus will come to the Mount of Olives and he'll go through the gate in Jerusalem. It is in Israel, not here. It's important that we understand the ramifications of Israel in our world events. And it's not just some fly-by-night nation who doesn't deserve to exist. It's God's holy people, unique people. Now, you are too, and we'll talk about the Bible spots specifically about you being grafted in to those things. And it doesn't mean that, that every uh, Jew, currently most of them are not believers, though there are many believers in Israel, at least that, that we met. But most Jews are not. In fact, many Jews today are not even god fears but most in Jerusalem are the main reason that God encourages us to study prophecy is to lay a foundation for holy living we need to have our lives cleaned up and ready for when the trumpet sounds Live as though Christ is coming back. Now, let me go to this little portion in Ezekiel again. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Gog is a person who rules over the land of Magog. Magog means the prince of Rosh. Gog, Rosh, is the old root word for the land of Russia. So when we talk about Russia, it is the land of the north prophetically. That's what we see. So when the Bible speaks about Gog and Magog, Gog is more of a prince, a ruler of Magog. And Magog is, is more of, of African descent and, and other nations there. But Gog is from the north. It's from Russia. So when we see in time events, we see the uprising of Russia, and they are now coming together with Middle Eastern terrorists, we go, uh-oh, because it seems to be setting up end-time events. But I don't know. I just know what the Bible says. And when we see these things happening, we go, uh-oh, because these are the characters of end-time events. Now, this couldn't happen if there wasn't an Israel because there wasn't an Israel for a long time. I want to remind you that in 1948, Israel became a nation again. And that started the clock ticking. Now there's a Jerusalem. Now there's an Israel. Now end time events regarding Israel begin to happen. And things have been happening. 
So when we read about these in the paper, and we see Hamas, and we see Israel, we see conflict, we see Russia, we see Ukraine, these things aren't just happening as though they have no meaning. They point to end time scenarios or events. Is it 100 years, 200 years, one week? I don't know. So I don't, I'm not trying to scare us to that. I'm just trying to say these things are what we're called to be awakened to so we draw close to God and live holy lives. Not to be conspir- conspirators and to go, oh, 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 oh. Gog, Russia, is the king of the north. Gog symbolizes forces of evil and opposition against God's kingdom and his people, playing a central role in apocalyptic prophecies concerning the ultimate confrontation between good and evil. Now, are there good people in Russia, Christian people? Of course there are. There's churches there. There's people. There's a, you know, a, a Russian who came to the church till so she moved up just a ways. And there's wonderful people there who love Jesus. But it's talking about the whole of a government structure. And by the way, those things are, everything changes. We're changing quickly as, Judeo, as a Judeo-Christian America to a non-Judeo-Christian. We're not called a post-Christian culture. They already are saying Christianity is past in America. The King of the South, Magog, is an Arab-African coalition. As a place, Magog, Magog is depicted in the prophetic writings of Ezekiel where he represents a land from which a coalition of nations led by Gog, who's Gog? Russia, emerges to wage war against Israel in the end times, specifically in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. So that's why we have this sense of, uh uh-oh. Are you following me? If you have any questions, you can ask Therese at lunch. On one hand, we are exhorted to Scripture to pray for the peace of Israel, of Jerusalem. In Psalm 122, 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. That's a psalm. May they prosper who love you. Why do we love Jerusalem? Because the people there are so perfect and so nice. I didn't find the people there being all that nice. Arabs were nice to me in Israel. But because they're God's chosen people to work out His covenant promises. They're not more special than you. They're just chosen for a particular duty and place. We'll talk more about that this week and next week. Genesis 12 Three, I will bless them who bless and curse them who curses you. And in you all families of the earth will be blessed. He's speaking about Abraham and those who would be his people, Israel. Some Jews and some Christians are working to revive an ancient ceremony that they see as a prophecy of the restoration of the temple and the coming of the Messiah. Many Muslims see this as a threat to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is the Dome of the Rock. The Red Heifer Ceremony has meaning in that Jesus performed it in His Passion of the Cross. And through it revealed the character of God and the nature of God's salvation work in regards to the horror of sin and its consequences and the atoning work of Jesus to pay for it on our behalf. So you just heard that and you're going, what? What is the red heifer? In scripture, the ceremony is found in Numbers 19 regarding the red heifer. After the Israelites have escaped slavery in Egypt, wandered through the desert, 
and receive the law at Sinai, that was the Ten Commandments, they are preparing to enter the Holy Land when God gives Moses and Aaron this ceremony. A red heifer. A female cow that has not born a calf is sacrificed to the east of the tabernacle outside the camp. Her blood is sprinkled seven times toward the tabernacle before she is burned in her entirety after she's dead with red cloth, hyssop, and cedar tossed into the fire. The heifer's ashes are gathered, mixed with some spring water, and sprinkled on the people to make clean those made impure by contact with death. The red heifer ceremony is part of the initiation of entering the temple. So here's the scoop. Are you ready? In order for the temple to be viable, alive, and ready to, for action, there must be a red heifer. Because it must be sacrificed. And the sacrifice of the red heifer and the ashes mixed with spring water is what cleanses us. And this is all symbolic. Really all pointing to Jesus. But we're not talking about that at this point. We're talking about in Judaism, the red heifer is part of the initial opening and entrance to the temple. So you can't do the temple unless you have a red heifer. And it's got to be perfect. And so for years and years and years they've been trying. You can't get a red heifer that has black hairs in its ear. Totally red, all together. Under two years old, never had a calf. And that's the sacrifice. Now what do you think that points to? And it's outside the camp where Christ was crucified. All that stuff. We're not, the point is, part of the battle between Hamas and Israel is this whole thing about the red heifer. They're trying to get the red heifer because they want to do the temple to take down our mosque. So we have actually... I hear there's five red heifers that they believe are going to, one of them just got disqualified because they found some other color somewhere. But they have heifers that they've raised to start temple worship. Now here's my deal. Man can't make God's timing come. We're going to make this happen because we're going to raise red heifers. We're going to do this thing. I think that's hogwash. Most Jews don't even believe in sacrifice. They can open up a temple and do all that without even doing the sacrificial system. They can stop. They can, they can do whatever. It doesn't have to be that because of the way Jews are now. Now, if the Orthodox Jew says, no, we're going to do that, then they do that and let it happen. But it's part of the battle now that we find underneath the scene of Hamas and the Jews and the Middle East and Israel and the United States either defending or not defending Israel. Do you have a better understanding of some of these things? A little bit? Be awake. Watch these things and then ask Pastor Larry, what does that mean? And I'll go, ask the Reese. No, I'll do my best as I keep track of these things happening to go how do they make sense to me and to us as a church or to Christianity how do they make sense we don't stand alone we're part of a church that's throughout the world how do they make sense to us I'm not a hypersensitive go oh, oh my yeah, I'm not that guy I'm, I'm not a sensationalist and, and, and I'm not a conspiracy guy I don't read that stuff every once in a while I get I have I have a contact who gives me all that stuff so I can filter it I praise God for Luke I'm sure he has a mind and he has a, he's, he's smart and, and he knows he's saying and he goes, here's what's happening and he's not, he doesn't believe it all, he just puts it out there. He goes, here, what do you think about that? And I, I look at it and it's helpful for me because I, I don't have staff. <laughs> he's my staff. So I get stuff and I can read it and go, okay, what does this mean? How does it make sense? But the point is, is that we're closer to the return of Jesus. When is it? I don't know. But these things, as these characters arise in these end times in the church age it just reminds us to be close to God all these things remind us to be close to God and to live as though he's coming tomorrow to live holy lives to not want to sin we're going to sin we're going to fall we're going to have failures but may your desire be for God 
And when you sin, you go, I'm not a sinner. I'm a holy person that belongs to God. I'm sorry I sinned. That we were looking to live holy lives and to think biblically, not worldly. When you find yourself agreeing with the mainstream regarding sexuality and all that's happening now, you're in the wrong stream. When you're abiding that whole agenda, you're in the wrong place. And trust me, I'm not thinking Republican, Democrat, good, bad, they're both full of idiots. Now, I go with one party because I think the Judeo-Christian policies are more aligned with the scriptures. I'm anti-abortion. I'm anti, a man's a man and a woman's a woman. That's me, not what you can choose. And a whole bunch of other things. But the fact of the matter is we are going downhill. And our current administrations are the worst in history, in my opinion. And I know some of us voted for them because we hope better. But currently, it's this terrible. What they're agreeing to and what they're doing. Even now, backstepping in regards to our support of Israel. And I start going, oh God. What's going to happen in the United States if we back up too far? Now I'm going to close with this passage And we're going to go back to it next week in Romans chapter 11 and 12 regarding Jesus and the atonement regarding the old system and the new system. But right now, let me read to you. In Hebrews chapter 10, the old system of, by the way, it's called the book of Hebrews, but it's in the New Testament because it's a letter, particularly to Jews who had received Jesus and were struggling to go back to the old system of sacrifices and stuff. And so they're being exhorted by the writer who we think is Paul saying, no. Let me read to you now part of Hebrews 10. We'll meet it out better next week and in Romans as well. The old system of Jewish laws gave only a dim foretaste of the good things Christ would do for us. The sacrifices under the old system were repeated again and again, year after year. But even so, they could never save those who lived under their rules. If they could have, one offering would have been enough. The worshipers would have been cleansed once for all, and their feeling of guilt would be, would be gone. In other words, if we took the Ten Commandments and we did the sacrifice and we did it once and for all, okay, we're clean forever. But they do it year after year because it's a reminder of our fallenness and God's holiness and our need to be atoned by blood. Let me read on. Verse 3. But just the opposite happened. Those yearly sacrifices reminded them of their disobedience and guilt instead of relieving their minds. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats really to take away your sins. Verse 5, that is why Christ said, as he came into the world, O God, the blood of bulls and goats cannot satisfy you. So you have made ready this body of mine for me to lay as a sacrifice upon your altar. You were not satisfied with the animal sacrifices, slain and burnt before you as offerings for sin. Then I said, see, I have come to do your will, to lay down my life, just as the scripture said that I would do. After Christ said this about not being satisfied with the various sacrifices and offerings required under the old system, then he added, here I am, I have come to give my life. And this is or are the words of Jesus. He cancels the first system in favor of a far better one. Under this new plan, we have been forgiven and made clean by Christ dying for us once and for all. Where's the joy in this room? (laughs) It's like, there's got to be joy here somewhere. You don't have to sacrifice. You don't have to do anything. Believe in Jesus, that's it. On 
Under the old agreement, the priest stood before the altar day after day offering sacrifices that could never take away our sins. But Christ gave himself to God for our sins as one sacrifice for all time and then sat down in the place of highest honor at God's right hand, waiting for his enemies to be laid under his feet. For by that one offering, he made forever perfect in the sight of God all those whom he is making holy. What's God's job? To make you holy. He does so through the blood of Christ and now he's going to work it out in your life as you live on this life. It's called sanctification. The process of becoming more like Jesus. Because Christ has done the work for you. Well, I'm not going to read any more other than the Ephesians 5.2 passage here. In Ephesians 5.2 it says, Christ loved us and handed himself over for us as a sacrificial offering to God for a fragrant aroma. God the Father is satisfied with the death of his Son on your behalf. So, why the end time temple? Because God wants sacrifices from the Jews? Absolutely not. He wants them to know that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. We are the gospel bearers, Christians. But the end time temple is there by which it signifies the presence and coming of God. And God's covenant, God's contract with humanity through the Jews. As we look at the Middle East unfolding as it is, May our antennas be raised up. May our, some of you are going, what's an antenna? What's raising up? Uh, See, that's, I'm an old guy. Yeah, that's right. See, I I grew up with a TV and on top of the TV, there was this, there was this weird contraption with these two wire things that stuck up straight. These two little like, you know, Rabbit rabbit ears, we call them. Yeah, they're just long poles. Like what you get, come out of your car. But that too. And you had to do them by hand. They didn't come up automatically. And they were like that. And then when you turn on the TV, when it's black and white, you kind of mess with that antenna till you got the signal. Okay, it's good. And we sit down and watch TV. So putting the antennas up was, was trying to get the signal. That's what I mean. May God put our antennas up. May we get the signal. May we see what's going on. May our eyes be open to see truth. May we not sway from the scriptures and be caught up in what others interpret the scriptures to say. But what is the scripture saying? And when we see these characters arising as countries, we go, uh-oh, hallelujah, God is coming soon. Don't be swept up by the sentiments regarding Hamas and the anti-Israel Palestinian hordes. There are good people in Palestine, good people in the Middle East, good Arabs And many of them have come to know Jesus. I've heard them speak. God came for all. But I'm talking about as a unit of people who want the destruction of Israel. Don't be caught up in that. Okay. Plans for Israel. Next week. Romans chapter 11. Jesus May our hearts be drawn to you as the world comes to this craziness. May we have a sense of why that craziness is here as you you are overseeing a world, Lord, that is trying to be destroyed by an evil one. An evil one who wants to destroy Israel and your people, the church. May we be awakened to the fact that evil's Presence is working hard to destroy your people, both the Jews and Christians. And may we stand as those who hold the gospel in our hearts. And may we go forward not in violence, but in love and in power of the Spirit.